Uh, so tonight we're honored to present uh, Jennifer Doompair, a dream hacker and founder of the uh, Aneuronauticom, uh, the international organization that explores the, th the phenomenological experience of dreams as a means of experimenting with mind. Uh, she's also on the board of Arrowid and is currently touring her book, Liminal Dreaming, Exploring Consciousness at the Edge of Sleep. She's got a few copies with her after the talk tonight. She'll be happy to be signing those for people again over at the table where we're also delighted to have a conversation with you. Uh, so uh, please join me in welcoming Jennifer to the stage. Thank you. So, okay, can you hear me on this? That's good because I, I walk around a lot. I'm kind of a kind of a mobile. I, when I'm talking on the phone, I like gesticulate. There's a whirling psychedelic space behind your eyes that's always there. And with just a little bit of work, you can learn to tap into it and go and have these extraordinary experiences. It's like a, an endogic high. It's something naturally produced by your body. And you are all natural liminal dreamers. In fact, uh, if you've never had, can you turn these lights down just a tiny bit so I can see people? Um, if you've um, never been aware of the fact that you're having liminal dreams, after tonight you are going to become aware of that. And a good 95% of you are gonna go home uh, and in the next week you're gonna have a liminal dream experience. Liminal dreaming is the space between waking and sleep. There's a dream space that lies in this realm. We tend to think of waking and sleeping as, oh, look, when it's there, I don't have light in my eyes. Hi, I can see all of you. Oh, hi. There's a lot of you. Um, we, we tend to think of waking and sleep as on, off. But in fact, there's a continuity of consciousness. There is a dream space. So when you're falling asleep and you hear maybe that kind of alien radio or you hear somebody whispering your voice or you have that hallucinatory part dream that's kind of weird, that is hypnagogia, your arm jerks or your leg jerks, you know you're in hypnagogia, you wake up, you feel like maybe you have started to form a thought, but uh, then you realize that what seemed like an idea is actually partly a dream. Uh, and you're going back and forth, like skimming awake and asleep. That's hypnopompnia. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen which means a threshold or a doorway. It's where we get words like limit. So between awake and asleep, as you're falling asleep, you go through hypnagogia. Hypnos is the Greek god of sleep. Uh, gagos comes from the Greek agagos, which is going toward. So hypnagogia is actually leading toward the Greek god of sleep, which is a nice image. And hypnopompia, when you're waking up, is uh, leading away from sleep. Pomp is from pompe, like pomp and circumstance. So what happens in liminal dream states, in hypnagogia and hypnopompia, one of the reasons that it's such an unusual state is that you actually access dream, different kind of dream, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. You, you have dream, and yet you remain awake. You remain so awake that you know where you are. You can count the chimes of the clock and know that it's six o'clock. You can hear, you know, I've heard my neighbor upstairs yelling, it's a sport event. Oh yeah, they're listening to a sport event. I know I'm in my room, I know I'm on my bed. Um, and yet I'm dreaming. This is unlike REM dreams or lucid dreams, which happen in REM. So in REM dreams, it's very credible, right? So even though you're with a bunch of squirrels on Mars investigating 
you know, the, the, you know, the new plant life that has taken over the earth. You believe it at the moment that you're in it. And you don't know where you are. You know, you're in the dream world. So even in a lucid dream, which is when this waking consciousness steps forward and to some degree you can control the dream, you still, it's still credible. You're still in a world that you believe and you're not aware of your surroundings. But in liminal dreams, you are. And yet, you're in a dream space. The dream space is unlike REM dreams, so unlike lucid dreams. Uh, it doesn't have the same kind of narrative arc. It doesn't tend to be stories. It's much more uh, free associational and non-narrative. In fact, what it is is a crazy, crazy kaleidoscopic, whirling, psychedelic swirl of your own memories and associations and what you're sort of perceiving in dream space. And if that sounds familiar to any of you here in the psychedelic society, that's not surprising. Um, uh, and it's, uh, so it doesn't tend to have the same kind of through line. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what happens on the, on the steps along the way. So it's kind of non-narrative. It also doesn't tend to have a self and other in the way that other dream experiences or waking experiences. So most of the time, you're a cohesive self moving through an objective reality, right? There's me, I'm moving through the world. There's a story as I'm, as I'm moving through this world. That's true whether you're awake or whether you're in dream space. But in liminal dream space, a lot of the time, there isn't a you and a world. There isn't a self and an other. In fact, what there is is this astoundingly fast moving, super wild, unfolding moment of now, which makes this an extraordinary opportunity for meditation, for self-observation. Um, so that's a little bit about what the experience is like subjectively. When I'm talking about these kinds of things, I tend to also like to talk about what's happening objectively, what the scientists say, basically. Um, because I feel like uh, scientific explanations of brain are, in my opinion, and this is of course a great debate, in the world of consciousness studies, and I really think about this in a lot of ways as a consciousness practice, although there's a lot of things that you can do with it. There's a lot of debate, of course, about whether mind is just brain. And I, uh, I come down and I think there's more happening than just brain. But I do think that understanding what's happening in the brain is, in fact, really useful. So um, when people are talking about measuring brain, they're usually talking about chemicals and electricity. Right? We don't actually know that much about we, I say as if I was a neuroscientist. Um, not that much is actually known about the brain, but what is known a lot of it is chemicals and electricity. So most of you probably understand about EEG, right? The, they put on something not entirely unlike this, but um, with sensors that is reading the, the way that electricity is moving through your brain. Uh, we all go through a set number of brainwave states over the course of a day and a night, right? There's only like seven or eight of them that we all go through all the time, right? So right now, we're having a conversation, we're um, engaged, uh, you know, we're, we're probably in beta, we're probably doing something like 14 to 40 hertz, which is like waves per second, right? Um, you all know kind of what that looks like. You look at brainwave states. Uh, most brainwave states are marked by a single identifying wave, like this 14 to 40, if we're the slowest is deep sleep, that's like 0.5 to 3, uh, that's delta sleep, so that's the slowest. The highest is gamma, that's like 40 plus, super fast, you're really excited, it's kind of um, actually linked maybe with lucid dreaming. Uh, so again, most are marked by one. Theta, which is where most of our sleep as adults is in theta, and really deep meditators go into theta. Theta has two sort of sine waves that identify it. 
So hypnagogia and hypnopompia, which only happen as you're falling asleep, hypnagogia, which, which can happen more often because it's naps or all sorts, of, or hypnopompia as you're waking up, which only happens when you've been asleep for a while, by far the shortest brainwave state. Again, you all do it every 24 hours, probably, unless you don't sleep, which some of you probably don't, again, given the context. But um, we all go through this, you know, maybe, maybe four to eight minutes, but it's got six different waves in it. So it is by far the most wild and chaotic brainwave state, even though it is by far the shortest. So when your arm jerks or your leg jerks, it's your body doing the same thing that your brain waves are doing. It's going chaotic. I like to talk about liminal dream work as uh, surfing consciousness. And if you think about uh, conscious mind as land and unconscious mind as water, pretty common symbols, where the water heats, hits the land is where there's lots of waves. It's where it's chaotic. That's where you surf. Right, so working with liminal dreaming is a lot like this kind of surfing, right? So we all naturally have this experience, but with just a little bit of practice, you can learn to locate and linger in liminal dream. And once you've learned a little bit of conscious dreaming, you can expand this space out. I mean, I can easily spend I can go into hypnagogia pretty much at will, and I can easily spend an hour or a couple hours, and I do, an hour or a couple of hours there, um, or in the morning in hypnopompia. Um, the difference between the two states, uh, again, I'm sure you're familiar with this, so maybe you've been uh, trying to stay awake at an event, and you're, uh, you start to slip off, and it's kind of hallucinatory, it's kind of dreamy, that's hypnagogia. And uh, unlike in most circumstances, please feel free to sink into hypnagogia and stay there. I'm the only speaker I know who likes when people sleep through my talk, so please feel free to <laughs> drop down into hypnagogia and stay there. But you all know that experience, right? You're fighting to stay awake, and then you're, you kind of go in, and there's that dream. Or as you're falling asleep, and you probably don't, without practice, you probably don't remember a lot of what happened because then you fall asleep, but you might remember that it's weird. Um, and napping is a great way to get at that. But when you're falling asleep, you're leading with the conscious mind. The conscious mind is slowly going offline. It's going through this continuity of consciousness between awake and asleep. But because your conscious mind is leading, it's a great place to work with practices because you can actually, with your waking mind, observe what's bubbling up from your unconscious mind in these dream spaces. It's both incredibly useful and also incredibly fascinating. In hypnopompia, when you're waking, you're leading with your dreaming mind. If you wake up naturally, which is to say without an alarm clock or you know, kids or cats or wh whoever it is that's waking up. If you wake up naturally, the normal cycle of a night of sleep, you're probably coming out of REM. So you're probably coming from the kind of middle of the night dreams that you already knew were dreams. And then you're slowly passing through hypnopompia, that all those chaotic waves on your way back up. And if you're somebody who can linger in bed in the morning, I'll talk about that again in a second. If you're somebody who can linger in bed in the morning easily, you probably know that really blissful feeling of leading with dream. Or if you're somebody who hits the snooze alarm, it's a great way to work with liminal dreams, who hits the snooze alarm three or four times, and you know that, and you're going back into dream. You're like, oh, it's just, I feel like, like whoever did the snooze alarm understood hypnopompia, because it's actually a great way to practice with hypnopompia, hitting the snooze alarm, you know, and so you're in that, you know, that super drift, but you're leading with unconscious mind, so it has a very different quality. So there are two really interesting and different ways of working with dreams, and um, when I say this about um, not all of you experience hypnopompia, 
the thing that we have most in common with plants is circadian rhythms. It's the 24-hour cycle. And if you have, um, if you are a chronotype of an owl, like me, you're the last person up at the party. When you work, you can work a really long time. The longer you work, the better you get. When you wake up, you're very confused for a while. You're, well, you're walking around very confused for a while. That means that you have an owl chronotype, this particular kind of circadian rhythm. You probably spend a lot of time in hypnopompia. You probably remember your dreams really clearly. If you, on the other hand, are someone who, uh, at the party, you're kind of the first one to be like, all right, are we done? And um, you go to sleep early, and as soon as you wake up, bing, you're wide awake. You know, as soon as you start working, you're really fresh. That's when you do your best work. Uh, you probably uh, don't get much hypnopompnia, and you probably don't remember your dreams all that much. A lot of people say to me, I don't remember my dreams, and I feel kind of bad about it. It's genetic. We inherit our circadian rhythms. So if you're somebody who's interested in dream work and you're like, I don't remember my dreams, but, but that sounded like you, you're a lark chronotype, you wake up really fast or whatever, then it's, it's genetics. But the good news is liminal dreaming is a great way to practice with dream work for someone like you. People who are lark chronotypes actually have most of their dream action in hypnagogia in the space when they're falling asleep. Uh, when I do classes and workshops, and this is, this is a slightly too large a crowd to deal with probably, I usually do an exercise to help people kind of try to find the hypnagogia. Who's sleepy? <laughs> not that many of you, not that many of you. Um, do you want to try it or do you want to not try it? You want to try it? Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you through a, a very basic beginning exercise for finding hypnagogia. My book, Liminal, that's good. My book, Liminal Dreaming, and I, I only have like 15 of them because I did an event last night and um, I sold a lot of them. But you can buy them on Amazon or you can buy them around. It's a very practical book. It's full of practices. There are like 18 different exercises, a bunch of which are there to help you uh, learn how to find the space, and then a bunch of them to help you learn how to use this space. Again, it's really easy. People often compare this to lucid dreaming, which is actually quite hard. It's a, it's a practice that takes a lot of work, unlike liminal dreaming, because we all naturally go through it. Right? Probably all you need is attention. In the next week, you're going to be falling asleep and you're going to be, in, you're going to be like, oh, that's what that lady was talking about. <laughs> that experience. I totally know that experience. So I'm going to lead you through a really beginning exercise for finding hypnagogia. Uh, you can go to my website, liminaldreaming.com, and you can both read this exercise and you can also hear me talking you through it, and of course, it's in the book. And if you don't, and probably most of you won't, given the fact that you're in these chairs or whatever, but the sleepy among you might. You might not find the space, but you'll probably start to recognize that it's bringing you somewhere with which you're familiar. And uh, I want to say one thing before I lead you in that. Imagination is the first thing on this continuity of consciousness between awake and asleep. So one of the tricks as you're trying to go into hypnagogia and become aware of the space is as you settle in, your imagination might start to swirl. You might start to remember dreams you had or, you know, just you know, go on this kind of daydreamy kind of drift, and that's great. Settling into the swirl of your imagination is, in fact, the first step toward finding this continuity. And if all you do, if all you get to in this context, which is not perfect for this exercise, is start to drop into that kind of swirl of imagination, you're already on the path. All right, so let's do this thing. I'm going to take questions at the end. 
So if you can hold it, let's do that. Um, okay. So what I want you to do, if you are bold and feel so moved, feel free to lie on the floor. Otherwise, sit back in your chair, close your eyes, and make yourself as comfortable as you can. As you exhale, feel all of the tension leave your body. Exhale your waking energy and your body tension out. As you exhale and as you feel your body relaxing and your mind loosening a little bit, wait for whatever comes. Maybe it's just a couple of flickering points of light. Maybe it's a strange sound. Maybe it's a little bit of an image. Maybe it's your imagination starting to swirl into your mind. Let this beginning hypnagogic dream come in to your consciousness. Perceive it. Exhale out your waking energy, any tension in your body. Let the waking energy that you are exhaling animate this hypnagogic dream. Let there be a feedback loop as the hypnagogic dream becomes more manifest. You come closer to the space of sleep. as the hypnagogic dream begins to wake, you slide down closer to sleep. There's a loop between you and the dream. And now I'm going to leave you there for just one minute and let you try to sink into this space. As I've said, if you found a hypnagogic space and you want to stay in it, please feel free. 
If you didn't quite float into the hypnagogic space, hopefully it started to give you a taste of that realm with which you are surely already familiar. I'm going to stress again that this is actually an extremely easy practice to access because it is so natural for us. As I've been practicing liminal dreaming, and it's been my primary meditation practice, consciousness exploration practice, for several years now, I've started to locate different steps along the way between waking and sleep, along this continuity of consciousness. There's very little written about hypnagogia, and even less about hypnopompia, even though it's such a common state. I know not why. I think partly because even though everybody experiences it, we tend to think of it as a way station, right? It's what happens to us as we're falling asleep or as we're waking up. And most of us might never have thought to stop and pay attention to what's happening in this liminal zone, right? We're so A, B, on, off, I'm going from here over to there, that we often don't pay attention to these liminal zones, even though so much is happening there. One of the few books is written by this guy, Andreas Mavramados. It was written in 1983, and it is called Hypnagogia. And in it, he identifies the four stops along the way between waking and sleep that he has identified. Um, but it's a subjective experience, right? It's just him you know, looking at a little bit of the literature. I, too, have identified four stops along the way. I'm going to share them with you. And with each one, I'm going to share you a practice for how you might access it. Um, as I said, imagination is the portal uh, at the beginning of this continuity. When you feel your imagination or your daydreaming start to come up, you know you're getting there. The first stage I discovered while I was at the opera with my in-laws. It was a production of Carmen. It was not a great production. And so I was drifting off into hypnagogia, but I wanted to track what was happening. And so I was listening to the music, and every time the music changed, I would open my eyes and read the supertitles, and then go back into the liminal dream space. So I was tracking, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking to these people over here, I'm gonna go talk to you too. I was tracking what was happening, I'm making this so hard for that guy, I was tracking what was happening in the opera, and yet I was in this dream space. And what happened is that it unlocked amazing childhood memory. So I had this at Carmen, I had um, the memory of the public pool where I went swimming as a kid, and the smell of chlorine, and, I, and what the lockers looked like, the color, the layout, my sister's bathing suit, the feeling of the sun on my skin, the water up my nose as I jumped in the pool as like an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old. Since I have discovered that this very, very, very lightest level of hypnagogia unlocks memory. So you can go into these amazing, and, and memories that I, things I haven't thought about forever, a lot of childhood stuff, but, um, and sensorily, super vivid, you know, smell and feeling, color, uh, very, very, very clear memory. So if you're interested in practicing that, try sometime when you're really sleepy, play a piece of music, something that you can pay attention to. Maybe a piece of music that you know, so you know all the different movements, or that has words, so you can pay attention to the words that are being sung, but also go into hypnagogia. So keep yourself just below awake. Because I have discovered, you can be 20% awake and 80% asleep, or the other way around, or half and half. Right, so this is just below awake. 
go another level down. Um, I have realized I'm a good touch typer. You know, I can touch, I can type without looking. That I can actually type when I am in hypnagogia. It's kind of a form of automatic writing. So I put my computer on my lap, and I go into a hypnagogic state, and then I start writing what is actually happening. There's a lot of wordplay. There's a lot of language. I'm going to read you one of these just a little bit. Speared asparagus, cooking class. Two Christmas tree angels hold hands. Mostly awake, but the dream gets deeper in the mouths of the little sea creatures, wiggling at the bottom of my field of perception, though there's no edge. Greet and pink, a set of cat ears in the very far distance. My upstairs neighbor yells, maybe a sporting event. The sound ricochets, the word ricochet. How do I spell that? Seems like it has a CH, but not. Crazen hussy, crazier, a pulsating light off to the right. People free associate all the time. So a lot of those um, uh, you know, automatic writing are like things like that. And when I'm practicing automatic writing, I like to think about it um, in two different ways. One of them is kind of like you know channeled material, or uh, I like to think about John Dee. So John Dee was um, basically the, the magus, the, the magician to uh, Queen Elizabeth during Shakespearean times, and kind of the model of the wizard with like the big canonical hat and the flowing robes and the stars and the moons. But basically, that's based on John Dee, right? He's kind of the Merlin figure, and um, you know he. A very fascinating figure. You should read about him. Um, but he and his pal John Kelly were um, were channeling the Enochian angels. So they were letting the the angels come through them and writing down these you know these this sort of channel material. And of course, there's lots of kind of channel material. That's one way I like to think about it. There's also um, the Dadaists, surrealists, were doing a form of automatic writing where they were taking pen in hand and going into hypnagogia and writing, and for them, they were thinking about language or unconscious, the way that language was manifesting itself through their experience unfettered by the waking ego having the grasp, the waking ego driving the ship, right? Once the waking ego that normally drives the ship is a little bit asleep, the languaging manifests itself in its own kind of way. Right? So I, I like thinking about both of these. And they're both wonderful ways of thinking about what's happening in the middle dream spaces where you have this really different kind of ac access to your own unconscious experience. So to, to practice this one, just get yourself into hypnagogia. If you can touch type, go for it. Otherwise, try, try you know, writing. You can also try drawing the surrealists also drew pictures, or they just let the pen go, you know, and, and sort of see what comes out of that. See what comes out of that when your unconscious bubbles up into a form that's usually very much driven by your waking mind. Next level down, um, I actually have taught myself how to speak when I'm in a hypnagogic state. Uh, I started working with a voice-activated recorder. You can get one for your phone, $3, $5 phone app. They're recorders, and they only start to record when you start to make sound, right? So they're voice activated. It's a great way of keeping a dream journal, because sometimes even just reaching for the pen and paper um, is enough to chase away the dream. So keep the voice activated recorder next to you. You can do it when you're napping, especially if you're a lark chronotype. Um, you know, try taking naps during the day. Or um, even in the evening when you're feeling sleepy, um, we can also take advantage of circadian rhythm late afternoon when you kind of feel sleepy, lay down on your couch, nap. Um, and then you can also leave it there overnight. Although if you snore or if you have like vocal animal friends, you might just have like a dead battery and like meow, meow. But, um, <laughs> but you, can, you can keep it next to you overnight and then in the morning, when you can just start to talk and you know, narrate your hypnopotamia, it's also a great way of remembering your dreams. And so I was using it for that, for um, dream journaling. 
And in a hypnagogic state, I started to realize I'm awake enough that I know what talking is. I know what's happening around me. And it took a while, but I started, and I, and I know people, I have known people who talk through their hypnagogia. I've practiced with this. Uh, I have a great story about um, somebody dying talking through hypnagogia, which maybe I'll get to tonight, but maybe I won't. So. Um, but I realized at one point that I could probably start talking and start mumbling through my hypnagogic state. And in fact, I can. So now I can talk through hypnagogia. And th those dreams have a very different quality. They're very, um, they're very visual, um, a lot of uh, um, imagistic. I'm going to read you just a short bit of that, too. I've got to turn my glasses, old lady. OK. A young man with a purple hat and his friends in a semicircle. They're all wearing striped suits. He's got a hat like a fedora, and he's talking very expressively with his hands. And as he's talking, the light is getting more and more purple, a brighter purple, until it's all I see. But then it's all hands playing a piano with moving clouds all around it, shifting, changing, animal faces, plants. It's plants growing so fast like a movie sped up. Plants growing, but all in purple, but round in clouds. It's clouds of plants growing. You can only see it on the edges, a weird psychedelic edge moving of purple coin cloud in the middle of the cloud. The cloud is just complicated, purple shape movement. I'm trying to shine a light on it. I'm trying to find a box to put it in, but it doesn't fit. It doesn't have a shape. I have hours and hours of, I can tell how awake I am because there's like, and there's the purple coin. I send these away to get transcribed. Um, and most of this transcription happens in India, and I sometimes wonder, they get this crazy, like, I'm, I'm kind of mumbling and I'm kind of like talking about purple clouds. And, like, what do they think of that? Um, but it's very, so it's a very different quality, right? And I get, um, I get these incredible, vivid gem colors and this swirls of moving image, like the hands playing the piano that turns into the plants growing, that turns into the clouds, right? Extremely visual at this state. Um, at the very, very deepest, uh, my, I've realized, and this was, this was actually how I started this work with liminal dreaming, is I started to have an experience that I had had in my 20s. Um, I, love when I, I love talking to people like you when I need to say this. In my 20s and my big LSD days, when I realized that I would, um, uh, as I was falling asleep after a very long experience, sometimes my body would fall asleep before my mind. Uh, and that's actually, I started to have that experience again five or six years ago, uh, which is what started me in on this. I was already working with dreams. I've been working with dreams for a long time. And I had, you know, uh, this, this crazy liminal dream. And I, my body had fallen asleep. I was like, my body's asleep, my mind is awake, and I'm dreaming. What the hell is this? And so I started to go in and explore this liminal dream space. So, um, uh, you know, this is advanced liminal dream practice, but it's also a great practice if you're just trying to locate hypnagogia. And really what you're trying to do is stay aware of the moment when you fall asleep. Uh, so um, probably if you have to wake up and go to work the next day is not the right time to practice this. Do it, do it at some point when you can spend some time you know, playing with it and not falling asleep. Um, by the way, liminal dream is great for working with insomnia, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. So uh, try to have your body fall asleep and keep your mind awake. So a lot of these same kinds of practices, breathing out, relaxing your body, settling in, letting your imagination drift. But if your mind starts to go to sleep, give it a little bit of mental rev, you know? Um, and if your body starts to fall asleep, give it just a little bit of juice. And then if, you're, if, you're, if you start to wake up too much, do relaxation. 
Breathe deeply. Try to lie still. Try to not move. You're not trying to fall asleep, so don't worry about what happens to you in those times, maybe when you have insomnia, and you're anxious about not falling asleep. You're not doing that. You're trying to find the hypnagogic space. So really what you're trying to do is not move, exhale, and sink into it. Let your body fall asleep. That's a great way to learn, even if you don't, even if you don't manage to find that experience, you'll actually start to understand where the hypnagogic space is. Again, and I, I know I repeat this often, but I can't stress it enough, you all naturally have this experience almost every night. All you need is a little bit of something for you to start recognizing that you're going into the space, to be like, oh, that's what this is. And it's like the classic riding a bicycle, which isn't true, by the way. You can forget to ride a bicycle. But you, can, you, can, you really aren't going to lose this. Like, all you have to do is start to find the beginning tendrils of it and fall into it, and you'll be like, oh, that. I already know how to do that. One of the things that I love so much about um, liminal dream space uh, is that it's a great space for um, creativity, for generating ideas, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But this whole part of the talk that I just gave you from the beginning of when I was talking about the phases, I wrote in a hypnagogic dream. Eric, can you rewind my, my, my purse? I forgot my mailing list. Thank you. Um, I, um, I wrote that whole thing in a hypnagogic dream, right? So people have been using hypnagogic dream space for creativity and generating ideas. Thank you so much. Um, for uh, generating ideas and creativity forever. This is, this is the point in time where um, uh, I, re I remember to send around my mailing list. Um, I'm a really, really bad promoter. So you're only gonna get an email from me every month or two Never, I never share uh, with anybody, uh, mostly this is for my events and for my, uh, my international dream group in which you can participate remotely when people all around the world on the same night use the same monerogen, an herb or a practice. Feel free to pass it around. An herb or a practice. So um, what happens is a group of us sleeping in the same space uh, hold down the fort. And on my website, I um, advertise what the Onerogen is going to be. It's always something that's legal, and there's always a practice and a substance. And then you, wherever you are, can join the couple thousand people around the world who are doing the same thing. So on the same night, we become a community of dreamers, right? Because dreaming is both one of the most common things that we as humans have. Every human who has ever existed Dreams, what a crazy thing to have in common with everyone, these nightly visionary journeys. Um, and yet, it's, it's very deeply personal. Your dream space is so your own. And yes, it may have elements from your tribe or your culture or your community or whatever, but it's incredibly individual. So I find that the act of dreaming together of all of us, just even some, a lot of people just do it with intention on that same night. Um, is, a very, is a very powerful occurrence. So uh, most of, mostly when I'm sending things out, it's when I'm doing an onerodonauticum and inviting you to um, participate remotely. So um, in the book, uh, there are, as I told you, a, a lot of practices. This is a book about practice. Uh, and the, the way that it's written is part one of the book, it's a little bit more like a standard book, it's talking about what liminal dreaming is, describing the subjective experience, talking about some of the science, talking about some of what you, um, what you might experience as you're going through it, giving you beginning exercises. The second half of the book is about different cultures and traditions who have different kinds of liminal dream practices. So basically, it's ways that you can play with liminal dreaming, or you can just read. They're like these like mini esoteric histories. And it's written such that you can pick the book up and you can read any one of those. Now that you've heard me speak, you can actually skip the first half if you want. Um, and you can pick it up and you can go to any of these chapters in the second half that might interest you. Um, I'm going to give you just a super quick rundown. Uh, we're a little, you know, I'm trying to make my time fit in here. Um, there's a chapter about uh, practice and perception about what I call liminal mind. One of the things that I discovered doing this work is how 
much of our experience is in fact a, a liminal. It's a feedback loop between you and the world. And as an example, um, uh, a sound, a sound happens over there, right? Travels to me on waves, goes into my ear, and is processed in my mind. Where did the sound happen? Right? So the sound is actually in the liminal zone between me and wherever the sound happened. Right? It's both me and not me. It's, you know, oops, sorry about that. Speaking of sound. Um, you know, and that's, I mean, and there's lots of examples of that. You know, a street that you walk down is so marked by what you expect to see there. So there's a chapter about what I call liminal mind. Um, there's a chapter about Dreamtime cartography about mapping. And I was just, for example, talking about these different levels of dream that I go into. We map different kinds of experiences. Um, again, you're the Psychedelic Society, so I can use this as an example. Think about Albert Hoffman. Uh, the first time he ever took LSD, no one had ever taken it before. He didn't have any idea of what to expect. If you were someone today who had never taken LSD before, you could easily go online and you know, figure out it's gonna be about 45 minutes, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna peak for maybe three hours, you're gonna come down, it's gonna, be, it's gonna give you a bunch of images, you might have an idea about what to expect visually. Like the territory is pretty well mapped. One of the great things about hypnagogia and hypnopompia is because they're so, because nobody's really talking about them, no, you don't have, it's gonna be you. I worry sometimes about being a gentrifier because I'm telling you a little bit about it, but mostly no one's really talking about this. So whatever happens to you in that space, at least now, is all you. There's no marketing. There's nobody telling you what to, what to expect. It's this crazy, whirling, psychedelic space that's so wild, but it's all going to be you. And in this world where there are so many tendrils trying to get into your attention, trying to understand what your mind is doing, basically to sell you stuff, this is kind of a space of cognitive liberty. This is kind of a space where you can go in there and just have whatever experience you're having with nobody else to sort of tell you what to expect yet. Um, so I have a chapter about that. Sleep paralysis. Um, uh, most of us have had the experience, about 4% of the population, 4 to 5, have it often when you're paralyzed, you can't move, maybe there's a, a, a scary presence in the room. Um, that's a, mostly a liminal dream experience. I talk about that, and if you're somebody who has that experience, in a room this size, there is somebody who regularly uh, has sleep paralysis. Almost, uh, yeah, almost always in my talks, there are a few people who have this. I have a chapter about that. Um, uh, dream incubation, the origins of uh, Western medicine lie in the healing cults of Asclepius, uh, which were temples, you know, around the ancient world, uh, thousands of temples where you would go both for um, physical and mental healing um, and also dream work. So uh, in, the, in this origin of Western medicine, um, there wasn't this sort of separation of mind and body and the, the priests of Asclepius um, were also trained in dream work and you would go into these temples and you would go into dream space. And by the way, in these temples, free range snakes Snakes are good for dreams. That's why um, you have the, the staff of Sclepius. A staff with a snake around it is the symbol of the medical association. And um, uh, you, uh, the, the oath that you take, the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates was actually um, trained in a temple of Asclepius. So, th so th that's dream work. I talk about that. Yoga Nidra, which is a, an ancient uh, yoga practice, although the way that we practice, much like asana, was set in the 60s and 70s. If you are interested in experimenting with hypnagogia, but, um, but my practices, either the ones in the book or the ones, there's many of them at liminaldreaming.com, um, don't work for you, or you just want to do it yourself, you can go online and find a yoga nidra, N-I-D-R-A. And yoga nidra is great, it's a guided meditation, you're lying down, it's not, it's not like this thing. You're, like, you're lying down. And someone is guiding you through this experience. And it's a great way to find hypnagogia. Um, I talk about lucid dreaming. Liminal dream, the most traditional lucid dreamers are the Tibetan Buddhists. And they felt that um, you know, basically you're trying to gain dream consciousness. And that's the thing I talk about. You, you can be a conscious dreamer. I never have bad dreams. If, if things start to go south in dream world, 
I'm enough of a conscious dreamer that I just change it. I just go somewhere else, right? You can be a conscious dreamer without being a lucid dreamer, you know, without this daytime consciousness stepping in and taking charge. And I feel like one of the problems in our culture is that we're so waking mind and goal-oriented mind, and we all think that that's important. I'm really interested in this idea of going into this liminal dream space and letting it take you, right? The yin, the nighttime mind, where you're not trying to control it, right? You're riding, you're surfing the waves, you're riding this, like, this, the drift of your own unconscious. And I think so much of what our culture needs is that, is people allowing themselves to sleep more, to dream more, and to not feel like we're controlling it. Um, I talk about uh, the, the shaman and the psychopomp, um, you know, about uh, the space between life and death. Uh, many people who are dying go through hypnagogia. Um, there's this doctor named Dr. Christopher Kerr who ran the hospice where my aunt died, um, and I don't have time for that story, but um, if you ask a question about it, I might. Um, and his whole thing, and he's just writing a book, and they're doing a Netflix special on him. It's good. His whole thing is that dying people are in hypnagogia. I discovered this naturally um, doing deathbed sit. So, in fact, the liminal space between life and death uh, is often in hypnagogic dream space. And then I talk a bunch about onerogens. So onerogens are um, what we work with at the Oneronauticum. Onero is the Greek for dream, and gen is to create, so like generate. So onerogens are anything that create vivid dreams. So um, indigenous cultures work with onerogens. Obviously, I mean, um, dreaming is the original altered state, right? So traditional peoples have been working with different roots and herbs to explore dream space and open it up and have different effects for a very long time. And in the modern world, there's actually a lot of technology. I'm part of the consciousness hacking movement, which is using technology like muse headbands or et cetera to play with consciousness sort of through tech. So a lot of those are also onerogens. Um, and so those are all practices. I'm really about, I'm a practical woman. I'm really about practices. What I really want people to do, I mean, reading the histories is cool. It's, it's fun, hopefully, you think so. Um, you know, you'll learn a lot about, you know, the Sufi idea of mundus imaginalis and, and uh, you know, uh, the idea of imagination as a faculty of perception, which the Sufis believe. That's something I talk about in here. Jungian active imagination, right? You'll learn a lot about a lot of topics. But my real hope is that you'll go in and you'll try some of the practices. And, and as my final thing here before I take practices, before I take questions, I'm, is I'm just going to leave you with, I'm going to come back over here. I'm just going to leave you with one um, practice that you can all easily do at home. And it's a great way also to try to discover liminal dream space. So uh, hypnagogia, particularly because you're leading with conscious mind, is a great place for generating ideas, like that idea of the talk, or for problem solving. The periodic table was conceived in a hypnagogic dream. Kekule famously understood the structure of the benzene dream in a hypnagogic dream. Um, Agassi figured out how to chip away stone and find fossils in a hypnagogic dream, and so on. I mean, at, at great length, I could tell all these stories. Independently of each other, Salvador Dali and Thomas Edison came up with the same practice for using hypnagogia to generate ideas. Um, very easy to recreate. So what they would do is uh, each man would put uh, metal plates on the ground and when sleepy, late afternoon, sit back in a big easy chair. Um, Edison kept a notebook and a pencil. Dali kept a sketch pad. And Edison would hold a ball in each hand and Dali would hold a big brass Spanish key. He's very specific about that. And um, they would lay back in the easy chair and go into hypnagogia. And as soon as the hypnagogia started to turn into sleep, as soon as they started to fall asleep, they would naturally loosen their grip on what they were holding. It would clatter and hit the metal plates, and then immediately Edison would start writing down ideas, and Dolly would start sketching. Edison invented like everything. 
And most of his ideas came to him in hypnagogic dreams. Um, you know, Dali's art is, is very weird and psychedelic and dreamy. Again, um, came to him. My talk came to me. So you can do this too. Um, you can try um, holding a handful of change, jingly dog toy. You can also try just lying down with your arm raised. This is a Charles Tart exercise. Those of you who you know, ex consciousness exploration. You can just lie down with your arm raised, and as soon as you start to sleep, you'll drop your arm. You can uh, keep a voice-activated recorder near you, or whatever it is. You want to draw, you sketch, you want to like keep a camera and choreograph your dance if you're a dancer, or keep clay, or whatever it is, right? So you can use this. Once your waking ego sort of gets out of the way, we all go into the visionary spaces of our own unconsciousness. The visionary is not just the realm of the artists. We all have the sort of the creative inside of us. And we all have things we're thinking about, things we kind of want to solve. I don't know how many people, you know, sleep on it. You know, I mean, I don't know how many people have in hypnagogic space been like, oh, right, that's what I should do. You know, whether it's, you know, my next life move or whether it's where I should put the chair. You know, um, you know, these things kind of come to you in these spaces. So that's just one of many practices. Um, I am speaking again tomorrow night at Third Place Books in Ravana at 7 o'clock. Um, and then uh, I will be talking a, a little bit of what I talked about tonight, and, um, but I'll also be talking about more practices. I'll be giving you a whole bunch of practices like the one I just gave you. So uh, please uh, come along or if you've invited this talk, uh, tell your friends to come along. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase um, oneronauts. Oneronaut gets bandied about. It's like people who are, you know, like sort of, you know, working with dreams. Onero, again, is the Greek for dream, and not comes from nautical, like sailors. One of the things about liminal dreaming is that you can go into it, you can learn, you can become like a dream practitioner so easily, all just, just by tuning into this thing that's happening. You know, and you can just try it when you're falling asleep. Don't worry about remembering it, if you know. Just, just don't worry about writing it down. Just try it when you're going to sleep. And then you won't remember what happened. Um, maybe you will, good for you if you do, but um, you probably won't, but you will remember that it was cool or weird or something. You might remember a little moment of it. And that might spark your interest enough to sort of go into the space a little bit. Um, in this world, I think there's a real call for us to meet what's happening in the world right now with creativity, with openness, with this access to the unconscious. Human beings are hardwired to experiment with consciousness. Little kids spin in circles and roll down hills. As adults, we do all manner of things to experiment with our consciousness. In fact, one of the definitions of being a conscious being, I feel, is the urge to experiment with your own consciousness. There's all sorts of things that you can do with liminal dreaming. You can use it in so many different ways, but it's also just this amazing way to go into your own consciousness and see what's happening in there. Play with it a little bit. It's free, easy, legal, non-hangover way of getting the most intense 15-minute trip you're really going to have, as intense as anything else you ever had. Um, so with just a little bit of attention, you can all go out and be dream sailors. Um, I really hope that, if nothing else, I have motivated you to pay attention to what happens um, it is a deep honor to be speaking, and thank you very much. Thick. Thank you so much. We have about 20 minutes for questions. You'll see we have these two microphones on either side of the stage, so please do come up and line up and use the microphones, um, both so that everyone can hear you and also for our recording. Um, and then um, there are, I, I believe, still some books and things over at the table, so definitely hang out and check those things out afterwards. My friend. Please. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I understand a little bit more. So I'm thinking about Sometimes, you know, you wake up and, and men would say, you know, while I was shaving, 
you know, I thought of this wonderful idea. And, you know, maybe you're not quite awake yet. So, so how, do you, how do you sustain or, or add more time to stay in that creative space? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I have made liminal dreaming my primary practice, I have learned to linger way more in this space. I mean, I'm not spaced out. Um, though I can go in there really easily. But, um, and I talk about this in the book. I've developed something that I call liminal mind, you know, where the more time I spend in this half-awake, half-dream space, um, the more easily I access what's happening to me in that space. So, if, I mean, if you start to explore it and you, and you think, oh, yeah, this is, this is it. This is, this is actually get, giving me the juice. Then just doing it a little bit more We'll keep you in there, and I love your Dreamcatcher shirt. Yes. Um, are you aware of any research about what personality types or characteristics are more um, open to the practice, or, or their boundaries are less rigid between sleeping and waking, as their psychological and environmental boundaries are um, thinner? Uh, so, um, yes and no. So studies. There, as I say, there are really kind of none. So if, when I answer this question, a lot of it's just going to be from my own experience and the experience of my colleagues. Um, so again, circadian rhythm makes a big difference in the kind of liminal dream space. Uh, people who are psychedelic people, either because of psychedelics or just because of their openness of mind, are great. And by the way, um, if you're somebody who has a regular relationship either with cannabis or with sleeping pills. Um, those are both REM dream killers, um, but they're great for, for hypnagogia. Dream. So if you're, I mean, they, and also, um, and like I, I give a lot of workshops at festivals, and those are great places for this kind of work because people aren't sleeping that much, because they're working with a lot of allies of various sorts, because there's a lot that kind of keeps you in the awake space. That's a great time to play with liminal dream. And basic meditators do really well. Basically, anyone who has spent time actively paying attention to their own consciousness tend to have a much easier time uh, finding and staying in these spaces. Thank you. That's a good segue. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask in your experience and your research, so I've been a dreamer for 15 years. I've had all the experiences you've described. I love your story about the boring opera. There's nothing better than falling asleep and something like that. It's just, but my experience is um, these experiences are very cyclical for me. There's times where I might go six months of just, oh, I, I'm in it every day, all the time, and then it'll disappear for six months. And I wanted to know if that was your experience, the experience of others that these the ability to access the states is very seasonal or cyclical? So, um, so I ha yes, and different. So, yes, um, I, um, I tweet a dream every day as at Onerifer, O-N-E-I-R-O-F-E-R, if any Twitter users out there. And I've barely missed a day for 11 years. So I almost, I mean, I use three a night is kind of my average for kind of remembering dreams. But that said, it kind of, it does wax and wane, um, depending on how much sleep I'm getting. I mean, the more you sleep, the more you dream. Not necessarily true of liminal dreaming. You can, um, you can, as another thing, if you don't sleep enough, liminal dreaming is great for you. Take a daytime nap. So there are, there are these kinds of like uh, seasonal fluxes. That said, um, as with everything else, attention. Whatever it is you pay attention to is whatever it is you're going to get good at, whether that's complaining or playing piano or like understanding what your cat means or tending your plants. It doesn't really matter, right? Attention is the big, like watch where you point that thing. Attention is the big magic juice that we all have. And whatever you pay attention to is whatever is going to come more, right? Like, like it's another liminal. Right, whatever is arising, you are what you practice being. Right, whatever is arising most in your life is going to be what you're paying attention to. I mean, not always, of course. There are circumstances beyond your control, like you know, war and etc. Um, but if you're paying a lot of attention to your dream space, um, your dream space is going to bubble up more. And by the way, um, nobody really knows why we dream, 
although uh, scientists now think that it might have to do with uh, moving short-term memory into long-term memory. Uh, fetuses in the womb are in REM like the vast majority of the time, like 85% of the time or whatever. Like, you know, what are they dreaming about? But it's basically mind forming and the plasticity in our, in our brains, right? You're, it's rewiring all the time. If you become a conscious dreamer, you're actually actively participating in what neural pathways are getting laid down in your brain um, because they think that's kind of what dreams are. That was a bit of an orthogonal answer. Yes. Hey. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the things that help get into dreams. You talked about various substances. They're called what? Onerogens. Onerogens. Because my experience with certain mild sleep aids, just even homeopathic things that contain passion, flower, I have the most humdinger nightmares. So I can't take those things. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know if that's unique or um, if you have any suggestions on things that... Melatonin uh, gives me nightmares. Create better dreams or... Yes. Totally. Can you speak to that? I have a chapter on onerogens. And if you go to my website, again, you can start at liminaldreaming.com, and then you can find my other sites. And I talk about a lot about onerogens. Um, that said, um, so rose, the scent of rose, when you're all, mostly when you're sleeping um, chemicals and electricity, right? So uh, when you're in REM... Um, or in most dream states, your body uh, floods you with chemicals that paralyze you so that you don't get up and act out your dreams. But your sense of smell and your sense of hearing are unaffected because it doesn't matter. You're not right. So you can smell and hear as well when you are sleeping as you can when you're awake. Now, how you interpret it, of course, is a thing. So scent and sound are amazing onerogens. So mugwort, the scent of mugwort, um, is really a good one. The scent of rose is really good for, um, to give you pleasant dreams. And, I mean, and, this, and the, un, unlike a lot of this other stuff, this is actually very well scientifically studied. So the scent of rose is really good to give you pleasant dreams. The scent of lavender will help you sleep if you have any kind of sort of insomnia. Um, uh, any kind of brugmansia or datara flowers, don't lick them. Um, the scent of those uh, will give you good complicated Dreams, there are a lot of uh, different herbs and roots that you can uh, take. A lot of them come out of indigenous societies that are ava widely available. Um, any kind of, um, if you're somebody who has uh, unpleasant dreams at night, what you can do, or you have children or you know, friends or whatever, little kids, this is the thing that kid, kids have, you can um, try working with center sound uh, use some strong scent or a, a very familiar piece of music or a recording and associate it with something pleasant. So let your kid have ice cream while you're playing this piece of music or while they've got the scent or while you're playing with them or you yourself, you know, walk by the ocean, record the sound. And then as you're sleeping, play the recording or have the scent near you. And actually by using this sort of associative practices, you can use the scent and the sound to um, actually uh, bring up different kinds of feelings in your dream space. Um, so that's, I mean, I, I could write a book on onerogens alone, and I may well, but that's just, that's kind of a good starting point. That's basically my question, too. Um, when you're in luminal state and you have a, a flashback to a childhood memory and it's not so good, you know, how do you handle that? I mean, how do you know that you're safe in that state of mind when you're not really thinking that way? Yeah, that's great. It's a great question. Um, so one of the things that does, I mean, in liminal dream space, whatever is in your unconscious is going to burble up. So for some people, that does involve working with some fear or working with some grief. Um, I have a, a few answers to that. One of them is if fear or grief is what you have that's bubbling in your unconsciousness, unfortunately that, or fortunately or whatever, that's your work. Right? You know, if that's what you've got in there, that's, that's, that's where you need to be going with it. I mean, easier said than done. Um, so working with s these scents and sounds is a great way to do it. Actually, um, so Yoga Nidra, I mentioned, N-I-D-R-A, and you can go online and find a lot of free Yoga Nidras. Yoga Nidra is that guided meditation that brings you in a hypnagogic space. Um, and actually right now there are a bunch of programs that are working, using hypnagogia to work with people who have PTSD, 
to work with people who have um, deep pain. There's a woman, um, my teacher actually, in um, the UK, who's working with yoga nidra and childbirth. Um, and what a lot of it is, it's sort of um, uh, inviting the experience yourself. So you, you're, and also the same thing with sleep paralysis. My sleep paralysis friends over here. Uh, uh, but you can bring, an experience you can kind of bring on. And what's happening is you yourself are inviting the experience in mindfully, right? You're like, I'm going into this hypnagogic space. This might be what arises, but I'm doing this and I'm inviting what comes, uh, doing it with consciousness. So that when it does arise, you understand that you invited it and that gives you some power over it. And also because in hypnagogia, hypnopompnia, you understand that you're awake, you have waking consciousness, you can just like set yourself the meditation of this is a safe space, I'm asleep. You know, you can even give yourself a touchstone, you know, give yourself something to hold and to touch, you know, to remind yourself. So when you're the one inviting it in, that gives you a much different relationship with it. Um, and again, the sleep paralysis chapter talks about that a little bit, but that's an excellent question. I wanted to ask you about um, uh, narcolepsy. Mm. And uh, um, so, and this is this is what happened to me. So I went to see my sleep doctor, and I say, you know, in the middle of the, of the afternoon, I get into this weird thing that I'm not tired or whatever, but it's like my mind goes away, and I'm not, you know, I'm not asleep, but I'm not awake. So I thought it was something that had to be fixed. And after listening to me, that sounds very much what you're talking about. So I wonder whether what we treat as narcolepsy situation could be. You Nar know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, was that the right? I'm sorry. Yeah, that was, yeah. um, narcolepsy is a very different circumstance from liminal dream space. And um, again, it's not as well understood, although um, I have uh, talked with, to some people who are, are going through narcolepsy, and, and a man with whom I've done a lot of work, his daughter uh, has narcolepsy. That's a very different experience because you're actually dropping down into the deeper dream states, like into REM. But what you're describing, uh, where you're, um, so for example, uh, if you're getting a massage or getting acupuncture or, and you like go into that half awake, half dream state, that's usually hypnagogia or maybe you're trying to do something, you're trying to read or you're trying to whatever. And that's a common one I have discovered since writing a book. You know, you're reading, people are like, oh, I'm reading a book and then I'm like, why is my grandmother in that book or a scene from my childhood? <laughs> and they're like, oh, right, I'm in, I'm in hypnagogia. Because now people are doing that with my book, which I totally love. Um, so it's actually, um, narcolepsy is pretty far in. Um, and is a phenomenon unto itself, but what you're describing probably is liminal dream space. So I guess, I mean, what, what I'm saying is that it could be that sometimes it's misclassified, so it's just because you're fading out, people say, well, it's narcoleptic yes. space. Well, in fact, it isn't, and there is no distinction between the two. It's not like you're going to fall asleep on the floor. There's a lot of weird um, diagnosing of things that probably are hypnagogia. So I talked about people who are dying. Um, who often go into hypnagogia. And because it's so upsetting for people's relatives that they're, they're, they're non-narrative, right? They're, they're talking, but they're in their own hypnagogic space. They often get medicated because it's called delusional. Um, or uh, people are having experiences where they're kind of going into the hypnagogic and people are like, oh yeah, that's, that's hallucinatory, that needs to be medicated. Or, or it just freaks people out, I mean, even if it doesn't go that far into the, into the medical. So, um, or narcolepsy. So there, I mean, uh, hypnagogia and hypnopotomy, liminal dream space, is so common. We all do it all the time. And so I think people will sometimes mistake it for something more serious, for something that's like dying in delusion or narcolepsy or whatever. But, um, but, they're, but in a way, they're sort of different. I know our time is thin. I will take this, these. Thank you so much yeah. for an amazing performance. This is yours, too. Oh, thank you so much. That was the last one. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, just quickly, I can attest to Yoga Nidra, and if anybody's interested, uh, Kamini Desai does an absolutely like amazing, mind-blowing Yoga Nidra, so she's one of my favorites. Um, Mugwort, as well, had some crazy experiences burning it. Like, yeah. I, I had forgotten about that until you guys <laughs> were talking yeah. about it. Um, but my question, though, something I've been thinking about lately, um, I'm a hypnopompic experiencer. I mean, mm, I fall asleep like this. So good. But that's where a lot of my therapeutic, seriously, like therapeutic dreaming is coming in. Um, and I actually don't know, like when you're in REM sleep, how much time is that when you're coming out 
into that hypnopompic state? That's question one. And question two is how, I understand setting intention, but how do you, or do you recommend any sort of practice for remembering dialogue? I, I have clear audience experiences. I'm very, I have a lot of audience experiences. So I'm trying to access that. So I remember dialogue in my dreams because I feel like I'm giving, getting a lot of information, but I haven't been able to hang on to it. Like it's there and then I linger and then I'm up and then it's gone. Yeah, Yeah. great question. Um, so the space of time that you spend in liminal dream is super variable uh, because you can expand it out. So naturally, it's only going to be like four minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes. But uh, with, with you're just learning, like recognizing it, um, you can, I mean, it can be hours, I can attest. Um, but remembering dreams. So there's a great practice of using hypnagogia. The body has memory, as anybody who has a physical practice or plays an instrument or a sport or yoga or whatever it is. The body has memory, right? So you probably sleep in one of like four positions, right? So I, I sleep like on my side with my fist on my forehead and my arm like this or on my back, which is the best dreams, right? So there's like four of my most common sleep positions. So if you're trying to remember REM dreams or even trying to get what's in the hypnagogy, the hypnopotamic state, um, what you do is in the morning, again, leave yourself time to linger in hypnopotamia, shut the cat out, turn the alarm clock off, um, and then when you wake up, try to do it as slowly and peacefully as possible. Try not to move. You know, as you start to come online, do it as slowly as you can. Do those kind of relaxing practices. You know, drop back in. And you might well, you know, you can really, like, a, like stone skipping over water, you can really go back and forth between the hypnopompic and the REM. One, and then see what you can remember. Voice activated recorder. And then once you've exhausted that, as slowly as possible, switch into one of your other sleeping positions. And then settle back in again, and then go through all four. And what you may find happens is when you're going into the positions in which you naturally sleep and sinking back down into hypnopompnia, it may bring back the dreams that you had when you were lying in that position. The body memory will kind of come forward. And it's actually, um, if you want to, to try to play with going in and out of the same dream, that's one of the ways that you do it. And, and it may, the dream may change as you sort of kind of go back into it. But again, with the voice activated recorder, you can just sort of mumble, what, mumble the words of dialogue and then go back in. You know, and that's actually um, a very, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow night, but that's a very minor version of Jungian active imagination. So I'm gonna take one more and then we're um. done. For the past 10, 20, 30 years, there's been a few people who, uh, quantum mechanics, are you familiar with sure. that? Uh, speculate. I both am and not. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, <laughs> speculate that um, the human brain might be possible to connect and, and somehow use quantum mechanics. Do you, do you run across any examples of that? Um, so uh, with the Oneronauticum, with my gym group, People, one of the things that I love about it is it's, uh, it's just, I'm, I'm a phenomenologist. I'm interested in the experience of things just for the experience. But people who participate in it, participate in it for a lot of different reasons uh, and with their own goals. And there are definitely people who have uh, joined in the Oneronauticum who are trying to find each other in dream space. And also, um, possible? <laughs> um, and also those of us who've been practicing the Oneronauticum for a long time, um, over the 11 years that we've been doing this, we've started to have the same kinds of dreams. You know, so on the same night, one night we were sleeping in a big loft space where there was dripping water, and everyone had dreams of being in water. So somehow, like, the, the, you know, we start to align you know, so we're, we're kind of in, we're all in the same kind of dream space, though we're also not. It's a complicated question, so it's a complicated mm. answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Gotcha. Thank you again so much for coming.
Um, if, you, if you do try these exercises and have any experiences, I always love hearing by email or whatever about whatever experiences people have had.